So welcome everybody, thank you for joining us today for the Times Money Mentor webinar, How to Invest in Property. I'm Jim Godfrey, Executive Editor of Times Money Mentor, and I'm delighted to be joined by Carol Lewis, um, Deputy Editor of Property uh, for the Times and the Sunday Times, and Mike Stenhouse, a professional property investor and also founder of uh, Inside Property Investing. So, um, so anyway, why are we here? Um, and there are lots of you today, and I, I think this is going to be a jam-packed session. But we're here because, as we've seen over the past few months, our home is now more important than ever. So it's not just where we live or raise a family, but it's also where we now work, and it can be an asset to be able to make money from as well. So we'd like to help, and who better to talk about property than our deputy editor of the property section, and also um, the team that built their own financial freedom, which started from, as I understand it, a simple renovation of their own home. So we've got experts here, which is fantastic. Um, so how this is going to work, we're going to try and keep it fast moving. We're going to start with a quick intro about why property is personal to us, uh, the challenges we face maybe, and then we're going to answer, roll into you know, your most um, uh, important concerns. So we're going to be discussing things such as the rent the room scheme, investing your own, in your own home, building up your own portfolio, and we're going to run through how to set goals to achieve financial security, how much do you need to get started, how to raise funds, why your own home is often your best investment, building your own portfolio and how to manage tenants, the pros and cons of investing in house in multiple occupation schemes, and how to invest in property during recession. And if we finish all of that, that'd be amazing. The whole way through, please ask your questions because uh, this session is all about you. So if you look down here, you will see that there is a middle tab with a uh, question mark in a box. You can ask any question, but you can also vote for questions that other people have asked, and the ones that um, come up are top ranked are the ones that we're going to answer. And we also have a few polls as well, so um, oh, we don't have a poll today, but anyway, maybe we will do. But at the moment, ask a question. Uh, so to start off, to kick things off, um, just to give you an intro on Times Money Mental. So it's a website that can help you afford the life that you want through all of life's ups and downs. So that's including career changes, starting a family, buying a house. And it includes personal stories, guides, videos, independent product reviews, so you can actually do something about it. Um, and then just before I can shut up, um, in terms of property for me, I have always found property something actually quite personal. Um, I remember buying uh, a home to raise my kids, then selling it when I got divorced, and then celebrating my freedom uh, when I bought my first property completely on my own, designed it in the style that I wanted and made it into a home that my children really love. And it symbolizes, therefore, quite a lot for me. Um, but I also think it's just part of this story about um, being financially able to look after the people that you love and how important that is. Um, and it's an essential part of, really, your overall financial health. So, um, Carol, I'll hand over to you. Hello, I'm Carol Lewis, the Deputy Property Editor at the Times and Sunday Times. Um, I've lived in my home for 25 years um, and always loved it, but started to rethink following lockdown, like a lot of people, um, reevaluating what's important to me and starting to look at should I renovate, should I sell up, you know, all those questions are buzzing around in my head. So. Yes, it would be interesting to talk about what you can do in your own home as well as what you can do in terms of buying additional properties. Yeah, I think we're all going to learn something today. So, um, Mike? Yeah, hi guys, I'm uh, Mike Stenhouse. I'm a little bit apprehensive about how much you've just suggested we're going to cover, Gemma, but we will, we will try our best. Um, so, I've been investing for uh, over a decade, started off alongside a corporate career, but then fortunately uh, I was able to make it my, my full-time income, I suppose, is something I've, I've been passionate about from my early days watching Sarah Beanie, uh, Property Ladder, and it just sort of stuck with me. Um, but, you know, one thing I'm hugely passionate about is the fact that our own home has often been one of the best investments we've made. We've used it to sort of work our way up the property ladder. Uh, and, yeah, I just think that it can be a great uh either addition or source of income whether it's you know something that you're actively investing in or just you know you look at your own home in a, a slightly different way to think about how that can can benefit you long term as well yeah fantastic as you said first-hand experience and, and using your own home to be able to go up the property ladder i think it really resonates as well so um if we just kick things off then about setting a goal to achieve financial security and i'm going to try and have a look at um yeah, look at some of the questions that are coming, we're getting quite a few in. But if we start off with about how to set a goal to achieve financial security. So I think one of my favorite quotes is, if you don't know where you're going, you might just end up there. 
and therefore, you know, actually setting a goal. And we do that. We talk about this so much on the Times Monumental website um, about the importance of being informed, um, starting a plan, and then using that to help keep you motivated. Because especially when we're talking about building, you know, either buying your first property or building a portfolio, it's something that we all need a lot of commitment. So, I mean, Mike, actually, when I when I start with you, because I know that you, there are specific stages that you you believe you need to go through for financial freedom. So it'd be great for you to kick things off. Yeah, we, we tend to look at it in three different uh, brackets, if you like, looking at financial security, financial independence, and then, you know, the sort of inverted uh, air quote financial freedom that, you know, a lot of people aspire to. But I think actually getting to one of the previous two stages, financial security, which is just knowing that your monthly essential expenses, whether that's your mortgage or your rent, your utility bills, being able to put food on the table, keep a roof over you and your family's head, that's kind of financial security for us. Uh, financial independence is about maintaining your current lifestyle. Um, and then financial freedom is where it gets exciting, right? You know, it's whatever you want, whether it's a private jet or, you know, just life on a beach is, is different for everyone. Um, but I think for, for a lot of us, if we could just get to the stage where you know, our, our monthly essential expenses were covered from, uh, you know, some investment income, whether that was property or, you know, sort of a more diversified portfolio, that would give us all such a relief just to know that, well, if there was a redundancy, if there was a mass pandemic and the economy tanked, you know, to know that there was something else alongside our day job. Um, I think, you know, we all get caught up, sorry, I'm hitting my laptop over the place as I get excited here, but you know, I think we get caught up on, oh, it would be great if I had millions in the bank. But actually, most of us just need, you know, a, a, a far less sizable chunk of money coming in on a monthly basis to give us a real feeling of security. Um, so, yeah, we always start off, you know, if we can get to security first, then worry about independence. And then, you know, if we can get there, then financial freedom can follow. But just breaking it down into more manageable chunks, I think, really helps us think, well, what, what do I need to do next to help me get there? And is it important, do you think, that you actually put a time against it as well? So it's not just so you can actually try and track how well you're doing. Is that something that you'd recommend? Yeah, we, we tend to look at sort of three to five year goals. It's a long enough period of time that you can have a huge impact. You know, most of us get through high school in sort of five or six years. And you think the amount of knowledge and progress that we can consume in that period of time, uh, you know, you can go and get uh, a PhD or so, you know, you can do a lot in, in three to five years. Carol, just to bring this then up to date in terms of news um you know are you hearing but because obviously there are lots more people that are let's say um you know being furloughed or you know having to find different mm -hmm. streams is this a trend that you're seeing that more people are looking towards property uh, to try and um be able to supplement what they're doing to be able to work towards financial freedom yes yeah, so it's a it's a real market of haves and have nots unfortunately some people are already furloughed or have lost their jobs um and other people are able to save during lockdown and save towards a deposit and, and get on that ladder of, of financial freedom that Mike was talking about. I think it's worth um, looking at if, whether you can use the rent-a-room scheme to bring in a bit of extra income, in you, um, help you save up, help you sort of tide you over this period. I think we are seeing um, a lot of shifts in the rental market as a result of what's happening to the economy. People coming, we can probably talk about this in more detail later, people coming out of short term letting an Airbnb and flipping to long term uh, rental or putting houses on market. <laughs> we, we're seeing tenants, uh, particularly younger uh, tenants, are, if they can, are moving from uh, single let properties into multiple living, which I know we're also going to talk about later, but they're doing that so that they can save some money. So again, that they've got a bit more towards a deposit um, and a bit more towards financial freedom. And also because if there's further lockdowns, they don't want to be stuck on their own. They didn't like being in lockdown yeah. on, on their own. So that, I mean, that, that makes sense. So, I mean, what's going on in the economy is having a huge impact on rental. That's what and actually, can we, and I know you said we're definitely going to be talking about it later, but I'm always aware, just to make sure that, uh, that we're, we're explaining everything for everyone that's uh, listening and watching. Um, the rent a room scheme, um, could you just explain that a little bit more for people that maybe aren't familiar with it? So you can, you can rent uh, your spare bedroom out if you're not using it as an office at the moment. If you've got a spare bedroom that you can actually set up as a bedroom, you, and you can uh, earn 7500 uh, tax-free. That's the rent a room allowance. 
Okay, great. Well, I mean, that's a really good tangible key takeaway to start off. Yeah. With. Um, and then, and it's interesting, again, if, you, if anybody's interested to go to the Times Money Mental website, there's a, about, you know, setting goals and getting started and how to make it manageable. I think one of our, it's interesting, one of our most popular stories, just to bring this all back to um, what's trending, one of our most popular stories is um, the story of Cheng Boon, who bought a property without the help of the bank of mum and dad. So, um, you know, it, there is obviously a kind of a need out there, but also a way to, a way to be able to do it without support because the support isn't always there. So I think this brings us on actually very nicely onto the second topic, which is about how much money do you actually need to get started and how can you raise funds? So actually, Mike, if I, if I kind of come to you um, to try and help people if they are interested, we've now piqued everyone's interest, everyone wants to do it, but how the hell can you get started, especially in the, in the lowest cost way? Well, I mean, I think Carol made a great point there. You can start generating an income from your own home straight away if you were you know, willing to consider renting a room out and seven and a half grand tax free doesn't cost you anything, right? Um, but for people who are looking to actually start investing, simple buy to let investing, typically you're gonna need uh, a 25% deposit. So that will vary massively across the country, but in, in a lot of areas you'll be able to buy a two bedroom terraced house for you know 100 to 150 grand say. So 25% of that as a deposit and you could be off and running. And some people that will sound like a huge amount of money. So. You know, it's about, well, how long would it take us to get there? What can we do to, to build up that deposit? Maybe refinance your own home and get some of the equity out of that. But yeah, a 25% deposit is going to be required for a buy-to-let mortgage. And then if you're buying something that maybe needs a little bit of work, um, you want to try and add some value to it as well, which is something that we like to do rather than buying a, a sort of off-the-shelf investment property. Uh, one of the ways that we like to try and increase, um, you know, our our portfolio value is by renovating it so you know maybe you're going to rewire it put in a new kitchen or a new bathroom so you know that that's going to cost you some money as well um you know for a, a basic renovation it might be as low as ten thousand pounds so you know that gives you an idea if you've got an idea of what property prices are in your area you can you can work out what you need from from that roughly no i mean that's that's um obviously really good and, and carol in terms of where the market's at because obviously, during this whole period, there have been so many different schemes that the government's come out with to be able to support people, giving people, let's say, a stamp duty holiday, uh, and as you said, all these different, you know, uh, rent room schemes as well. In terms of the mortgage market, what are you, what are you seeing there? Has it become? Because obviously, you know, banks they always like to lend, but when people's jobs are mm. less secure, they're also going to make things a bit tighter in terms of their. Yeah, there's a lot less buy to let mortgages out there. Uh, I think I have some figures somewhere that um, show we've gone from nearly 3,000 buy-to-let products in March down to sort of 1,500 now. Wow. Um, and the rates have gone up slightly as well. <laughs> so they are, the, the banks are quite nervous. They're eyeing what's going to happen when furlough um, unwinds and when the mortgage deferral um, holiday, the payment holidays um, come to an end in autumn. So they're looking at that very much. Um, and we've heard anecdotally that the bank valuers are also being much tougher on rental predictions for buy-to-let mortgages. So that's definitely worth bearing in mind. But I would say overall, although there has been, um, I mean, at the moment there's a lot of talk about a mini property boom and we know that buy-to-let investors have been included in the stamp due to holiday and they're taking advantage of that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't rush too much because we can see that prices, asking prices have gone up you know, by as much as you're going to save. And in the long term, you know, um, the, the, the property forecasters are looking at housing prices and they're revising them almost every week at the moment. Every time the Chancellor announces uh, a different scheme, they're revising what's happening. But Savile's new um, forecast that came out this week we're saying, okay, we're only going to have, say, 4% uh, price rises this year, and then it's going to plateau next year. But over five years across the country, we're looking at a 20% rise. And, I mean, higher in some areas, too. I think um, the highest was in the Northwest, where they were looking at 27% over the next five years. So in the scheme of things, it's better to think long-term yeah. than, than it is you know, the short-term. The other trend I want to mention, because uh, it, it did surprise me, is there are more first-time buyers looking at becoming buy-to-let investors. So they're looking at buying a buy-to-let property before they buy their own first home to live in. 
Okay. Now that that's generally because they're priced out of the market in London and the South East, but they still want to get on the property ladder. So rather than waiting and waiting to build up deposit deposit, they're looking at buying elsewhere in the country so oh. that they can get on the property ladder, um, which which is, you know, there's about 5,000 people doing that a year at the moment, and we know that there's been a big increase in searches for buy-to-let mortgages by people who don't own a home. So that might be increasing. But, but the thing to bear in mind is you can't use things like the lifetime ISA to do that. Yeah. So. I think... Um, oh, go on, go on, Mike. Go, go, Sorry, go. no, I, I just... Just to, to support that, I, we see that as well. And, uh, you know, my experience is more anecdotal. But um, the, the other reason that we see that as well as being priced out of the market is there is, uh, I think in the UK, we inherently have this this uh, belief that bricks and mortar is a relatively safe investment. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're becoming a bit more transient. A lot of, you know, life now includes, uh, you know, sort of rather than waiting for retirement, we want to take mid-career breaks to go on sabbatical and things like that. And actually, um, you know, buying an investment property so that we have some foot on the ladder whilst we go and travel or we maybe move to a different city for work for a couple of years and aren't sure if we're going to settle there. It gives people a way to, to benefit from some of the, the capital appreciation that they see without it necessarily needing to be their own home. So in, in some ways, it's people are making that choice from a, a positive light as well, rather than necessarily just being priced out of the market. It's thinking, well, yeah, I believe in the value of property, um, but it doesn't suit my lifestyle at the moment. So an investment is a good sort of middle ground for them. No, I think that's great. And I think, funny enough, that's not the way that we're kind of brought up. I agree. It's, and it's, again, it's so different from in America or even in Europe. So there's much more of like a, a rented mentality, whereas in the UK, it's you buy a property, you settle down, you stay in one place, job for life. But more and more, you're right, especially because of digital technologies and more people are being freelancers or entrepreneurs, setting up their own jobs. People do need to move. And of course, because of the whole coronavirus, people also... It's great they don't have to live in the centre of London either, and they, you know, you can kind of move around as well. So I think that's a really, really important point. I'm going to bring in a question that was asked, and it's the top of the poll, uh, the top of the uh, ranking at the moment. Um, and Mike, this one would be for you, which is, um, uh, we've been asked by Carl, um, how do you, how to manage taxes efficiently, the extra income you're earning when you're working full time. So is there any any practical tips on that? Because it is true that all of a sudden, you know, it's not taken out of your pay. Uh, you're suddenly having to manage it yourself. Uh, any tips? Yeah, I mean, my, my cop-out answer uh, <laughs> is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a financial advisor and there are strict regulations in place about advice that we can give to people. So, you know, it's, it's one of these things where it depends on a lot of factors. What other income you have, you know, is property your primary income? Is it an additional income? Um, how much income? Because there are there are some ways that the portfolio can be built between you and a spouse in a tax efficient way. So maybe if you've got a higher income and they've got a lower income, uh, there are things that you can do to put ownership, uh, you know, spread ownership between the two of you. Um, also, you've probably seen a lot of this uh, a trend to buying investment properties through a limited company, um, which in 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 a lot of ways can be more tax efficient, but isn't always the right answer. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think the, like I say, the, the cop-out answer is everyone's circumstances will be different. So speaking to uh, a qualified accountant, a qualified property tax advisor um, will be the best way rather than saying, oh, well, Mike said this, uh, which is always, always dangerous, sure. right? Because what works for us doesn't necessarily work for you. And I would love to be able to sit down and say, this is what's going to be the best thing for you. But there, there are so many variables that it would be, uh, you know, I, I, I'd be hesitant to give any specific advice. Answer. No, great. Could, I just, so could I just add Could I just add something in? I mean, uh, Mike's given a very thorough answer, but one uh, other point to make is that uh, furnished holiday lets um, come under business property. So they also are quite tax efficient. I mean, there's, there's other problems in terms of, buying in popular tourist resorts and, and so on, but they're, they're tax, quite tax efficient as well. Brilliant. Everyone, I love it. Um, okay, no, I, I, think, I think that's really great. Um, so if we move on to kind of the next subject, which is about your own home. So we, we've all been talking about this. Obviously, we're all spending a lot more time there. Um, why your own home is often your best investment. So I'm not sure, Carol, it, would it also be just, because I think you made a really interesting um, comment, which is you said that the price the price of the market might be flattish for the next, you know, while, 
Um, but it looks that there's predictions that could be, you know, uh, increasing by about 20% over the next five years. What are the, what are the, what's driving that? Because that is, that is staggering. Is it people moving out of London? Is it, you know, is it, as you said, it's mainly in the northwest. What, what do you think is driving um, potential uh, rise in, in property markets, which would make your, your home, if you can continue to just upscale, one of the best mm. things? I mean, I see someone has uh, said in the comments that, that the time stated that property prices would drop by 20% at one point. Uh, and, and it's true, we have. We have. Um, honestly, all, all the analysts are revising it every time there is a statement and every time there is a forecast and unemployment or an economic initiative announced. They are literally all over the place. I think um, the Centre for Economics and Business Research is saying about 8 to 10% drop over the next year. Savills and Hamptons have just come out with 2 to 4% this year and stagnation the year after. So there is a lot of variability, um, definitely. But the long-term trend is going to continue to be incremental growth. So, and, and, and in some places much higher than others. And for the foreseeable future, it's going to be outside of London and the South East. I mean, up to now, it's been in London and the South East. So now it, it's going to be further afield, Wales, um, the Midlands and the North. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean... No, that, no, no, that, that makes sense because, um, you know, anecdotally what we're, we've been hearing is, um, you know, a lot of people were focused on, you know, the prestige of getting like a nice little flat in the centre of London. And then you're locked yes. in that yes. space for like, you know, six months. All of a sudden you've suddenly realised actually getting a garden and, you know, a bit more space. Yes, I mean, and that's true. The, the, the trend, the premium prices now are out of, out of London or mm. in, in the suburbs of London with a garden, with a space that you can have a study in. Um, and the trend is the same for rental, actually. Rental is not the same as everyone else. So in terms of how you dress a rental property, it's worth probably making sure there's an area where there's a, a work from home station, whether it's in a, a sort of under the mm. stairs or you, know, you don't necessarily have to give up a bedroom. There's also much more emphasis on fast broadband. So, you know, in terms of renovations, that might be one of the first things you think of. Put in a fast broadband or put in a mesh system so there aren't black spots, that, that kind of thing. Um, and, and maybe dress up the outdoor space, what there is of it, a little bit more. I'm writing all that down. That's brilliant advice. We're going to read outside the space. Brilliant. Um, so, and actually, Mike, just, I mean, you've got a few different points in this as well, I know, so I want to make sure that I come to you as well, about, um, about some of the tax benefits, not giving specific personalised advice, but giving some of the tax benefits about your own home um, and, you know, renovating and things like that and switching between, you know, um, uh, ownership and rental, etc. I mean, because yeah. you've obviously had first-hand experience of this, so it's great to hear, you know, what you've what you've been doing, what you've experienced. Yeah. Wait, why are you crazy? Can I, can I just chip in a bit more? <laughs> so I was going to say, on, on renovating, um, yeah. there are a few, few points. If you're not planning on, if you're planning on moving within three to five years, mm -hmm. then actually it's, you know, really think twice about it because it, it can be a lot of money and a lot of upheaval. So ideally, if it's your own home and you're renovating, it should be that you kind of get some benefit before you, try and sell on then you'll make the most value from it yeah. and also be careful about outpricing your street so <laughs> in terms of it it's better to buy a, a house that's probably the lower value end of the street and bring it up rather than buy the house that's kind of at the upper end and bring it out you know too high up so that nobody wants to pay that price in that street that's so funny. I was always told that when I was growing up. I always remember hearing that, like it was like an old wives, like a whatever, which is never buy the best house on the street. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> uh, and and in terms of uplifts, you can for for most things like a. a I mean, it depends where you are, what the house is, and and you know, which street you're on. But you can look between you know five and ten percent um, for things like single story extension and a, a, a loft conversion. Basements are where you have to be really careful. They can actually cost a lot of money and not give you a great deal of return. I wouldn't say they're worth doing unless you've got a very expensive house in a very expensive area and you can't do anything else. Only if you need like a swimming pool, you need the gym, you need the spa, you need yeah. the spa. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean obviously if you want those things in your home, that's a completely different thing. If we're just talking about monetary value. Value, yeah. No, yeah. No. Okay. Mike? 
Yes, sorry, I'll try not to break out this time. Um, so I think the from a, a sort of a, a tax point of view, the main thing is uh, capital gains tax. Uh, you know, you're, you're not going to pay tax on any profit, in inverted commas, uh, that you make on your own property. So if you buy it, you add value to it, or if, even if it's just through capital appreciation over a number of years, you're not going to be taxed on that uplift, which is great. Um, the, the, what, what worked particularly well for us and what we see working for a lot of people is when we, uh, we, by we I mean, uh, my wife and I first got together, we wanted, you know, the, the aspirations for the big house and the driveway and the big garden and all that sort of stuff. And it was, it was out of our budget. Um, so rather than sort of think, well, you know, we'll save up for 10 years in rent, we thought, well, let's buy what we can afford now, which was a two bedroom flat. And we renovated that, added value to it. Uh, there wasn't any scope here for loft conversions or sellers. It was, you know, within the constraints of the four walls that we had. Um, but we bought the worst house on the nicest street or, you know, to, to that effect. Um, and it was a, a cosmetic renovation. But over the course of the two years that we lived there, there was an uplift in value from the work that we had done so that when we sold it, we had a slightly bigger pot of cash to move on to the next one. And it wasn't a case of, you know, trying to get around tax by saying that it was our own home and moving every six months we enjoyed the benefit of living in this newly renovated home so it was it, it sort of hit both sides of it um and we did that a couple of times and then eventually we got to the stage where uh you know we were then able to to buy the the nice house that, that we liked and we've done that by creating value in our own home and you know you then pass that on to the next owners so who hopefully appreciate it and there are lots of things, like Carol suggested, that you can do. Some easy, some a bit more uh, extensive single-story extensions and loft conversions and that sort of thing. But planning laws are getting a little bit more relaxed just now as well. So you, you can actually do quite a lot to your home without needing to worry about you know planning applications and, and that sort of stuff. You, you can do loft conversions. You can do single-story extensions without needing to go down the, the sort of rabbit hole of planning applications, which is quite nice. Can I just add something to that? Um, if you do do that, if you do the uh, permitted development rights where you don't need the planning um, application, it is worth applying for a, a lawful development certificate just so that when you come to sell, it holds its value and there's no hassle. It just says that you, you did everything correctly. Wait a minute, let me, let me just, because that's, that's a really, really good point. So basically, um, this is an example of you don't need planning permission to be able to do something, but after doing it, you still get somebody to come over to to verify that you did everything in the right way? Or should yeah. you, or could you flag it with them in the beginning? So is it something you do afterwards or in the beginning? Oh, I, oh, I don't know, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, um, it might, it might help. <laughs> might, no, but so, that's a really good point. I think that's a really good point. Because, like, people always ask, whenever they do the due diligence on buying yeah. a house, they ask you for all the checks and all the certificates. So, yeah, yeah. There, there are there are two two different things that I think are, are being mentioned here. The first is the certificate of lawfulness, which Carol mentioned, and then you, I think what you were talking about, Gemma, was uh, building regulations to so sign off from a building yeah. inspector to make sure that everything has been done within the building regulations requirements, so right. that it's been done safely, lawfully. Um, so getting both of them done is very important. Okay, got it. Thank you. That's brilliant. Well, there you go. That's two tips for the price of one. Um, okay, fine. So uh, moving on to the next one, because gosh, we're, we're running. Oh, we've got so much to get through, but this is, this is fantastic. It's jam-packed. Um, and actually, uh, to answer somebody's question that they've been asking, this came from Peter and also somebody who's put their name down as R. Uh, people are asking whether the recording is going to be available afterwards, and it is. So if you haven't missed anything, don't worry. But, you know, I will summarize at the end, and it will be available um, afterwards as well. So let's go into the pros and cons and risks of investing in a house in multiple occupation. I mean, again, and it, I, think, I think, Mike, you said that, you know, you can discuss these for days. So would you mind, I mean, first of all, can you just give an overview, just a very, very basic overview of what they are and then, and then you know, what you think of them? Yeah, uh, sadly, the, the, the common uh, view people might have in their mind is from the young ones with a group <laughs> of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of an older reference, but, uh, you know, a group of students living together and just doing their best to, to trash the house on a, on a weekly basis. Um, Student lets are the most common sort of house and multiple occupation uh, setup that you get all across the country. In, in student cities, you will see houses that have been um, let out on a room by room basis, typically. Uh, but there's also uh, a couple of other popular markets. The, the one that we tend to operate in is for young professionals. And these are becoming very popular. Carol, you mentioned a couple of reasons why you know people actually like the, 
the social interaction of living with others rather than a one bedroom flat where they might not see anyone from getting home at 5 p.m. to going to the office the next day. Um, but there's a there's an affordability piece there as well. You know, it's it's more affordable to rent a nice room in a, a shared house than it would be to rent a one bedroom flat. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, a basically. I mean, the, it's the, the the legal definition is three or more people sharing sharing a house. Three or more unrelated people uh, sharing a house. But it could be anything up to. I mean, in London, you've got these sort of co living spaces as they're being branded, which can be you know hundreds of of people sharing facilities. Um, and anything in between that really kind of fits into the definition as well. And what's the benefit? What's the benefit of doing them? Do they get special tax um, treatment? Do they get? I mean, what's the what's the benefit of having that type of property? Uh, for, for for my point of view as an investor, and this is where um, you know you, they, the, the reality is that they are they can be profitable. You can take a house that um, you know a, a three, four, five bedroom house, and if you rent it out on a room by room basis, typically. Uh, even though we're including bills and council tax and that sort of stuff, our profit would still be higher than it would be if we were renting it out as a family home. Um, okay. There's concern about them and there are restrictions being put in place in a lot of areas. It's called an Article 4 restriction where the council feel like there are enough HMOs to meet demand in that area. Um, our, our typical approach is rather than converting houses which are in demand is we will take you know old offices, um, commercial space and, and convert that into to residential. So you know we're we're trying to add to the housing stock rather than take from it. Um, but yeah, it, it, the 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 gist of it is they can be a very profitable uh, way to invest in property. Okay, uh, but obviously as you said, be aware there may be more restrictions, especially if you know they're not deemed as you know as as, as needed. So um, so to kind of move on then and just actually kind of we've gone into the nitty gritty, but taking a little bit of a step back as well. And it's kind of where we started. Um, and, and Carol, I'll come to you first on this. It's all about you know investing in property during a recession. So I guess you know the silver lining and in, in, in what we're seeing is um, that while you know times are tough and, th and things are really tough for a lot of people, if there are, as you said, for the shorter term, any dips in markets or you know any stagnation, and while there's there's an opportunity through government support to be able to get onto the property ladder, you know, is there a uh, I'm just trying to think about the way in which people can, um, you know, exploit this opportunity as much as they can. You know, from what you've seen before in pre previous recessions, is there anything we can learn from that? Um, any trends that usually, you know, come out of, you know, when, when people find out having a really tough time uh, to be able to take advantage of the opportunity in the property market before things re rebound, rebound, especially if we think that longer term things might be a bit better. Is there anything that we can learn? Um... I mean, part of my hesitation is things are... are are quite different this time mm. I mean if property prices dip then yes you might be able to to pick up a bargain um, I hesitate to use that word that that might be possible um, I personally am not sure there are going to be bargains around the other thing is if the recession does hit very hard and there are all these people who are on furlough do lose their job and at the moment we don't know if the um, new measures that Rishi has um, implemented whether they will, you know, soften the spike of unemployment on how by how much. But if we do have a big spike in unemployment, and we do see when the mortgage holidays um, end that there's a, a quite a few people struggling to pay their mortgages, then we might see more properties come on the market as a result of that, which in turn will make property prices drop because the supply will go up, and those buyers are more likely to accept reduced offers. And to you know, sell at a discount, uh, and that's that's unfortunate. But yes, I mean, you might be able to get in on that. I wouldn't bank on it. I wouldn't play the market. I would I would look more at long term trends if I'm honest. No, I know, and it's interesting because again, when everyone was talking about the um, how, how fantastic the, the stamp duty holiday was, holiday is, you know, there was a, there was a counter argument which said. Of course, from a buyer's perspective, they're getting this holiday. But from a seller's perspective, if they know the buyers are going to get mm. this holiday, they're going to know that they have more capital then available to invest. Yeah. And then actually the prices will be a bit higher. So, yes. so yeah. and that's what's happened. The prices have gone up by as much as the saving on the stamp duty. So <laughs> people aren't stupid. <laughs> okay. okay, that's good to know. Hey, Mike? Uh, I mean, I'd really just echo um, Carol's comments there in as much as we would never try to, to beat the market, so to speak. We're typically investing for the long term. Um, so 
we are looking for property. Um, typically, I, I said this earlier, but we will try to add value to it when we buy it. So we will buy things that need some work to it rather than just sitting and hoping that capital appreciation will, will come into thing. We, we will try to actively add value to, to property. But we're, we're buying things for you know 10 plus years. And whilst we appreciate that things might go down, might go up, ultimately over the long term, if we're thinking about you know, pensions, legacies for children, for grandchildren, that sort of thing, as well as the income that we can generate from it now. And rental income typically does quite well during a recession because there are difficulties with buying homes and things. So the rental income side of things short term is usually fairly safe. Um, but from a long term capital value point of view, uh, we're typically thinking that things are going in a, a general upward trend, even if there are peaks and troughs along the way. Um, so we, we don't try to time the market I think that can you know I, I probably nicked that off Warren Buffett who you know says similar things mm. he, he buys and waits he doesn't you know wait to buy at the right time he buys things that he thinks are good value at that point in time and then you know over the course of uh, the lifetime of that investment it's probably going to go up in value can I just nip in with a quick stat <laughs> for, like statistics yeah and um, so last year the average buy to let um, owner sold uh, for a £70,000 profit, you know, base, basically what they bought the property for, what they sold it for, and the average time span was 10 years. Um, so that doesn't include the rent and, and the cost and anything, but that's just the basic bought and sold price, 70000 and it's much higher in London, but that's, that's, as you said, that was the average 10-year profit. Um, yeah. No, that's fantastic. I mean, that, that's obviously that's good. It's good to be able to kind of quantify these things as well. And actually, uh, Mike, just picking up on something that you mentioned, you said about, and you have always talked about how important it is to focus on renovations. I'm sure people that are, are watching this will be really interested to hear. And, and again, you've mentioned the different spans, but from your own personal experience, what was the best renovation that you did? As you, and you talked about a few things: extensions, the loft. Um, I mean, liquor paint. You know, it can be kind of bit, you can do the whole span. But what did you? Think was the best thing that you did in terms of a renovation because a lot of people will be thinking about it. And also, have you ever made any mistakes? Like anything that you did, oh, yeah. if it turns out it was a complete waste of time, and everybody that's watching can save themselves a lot of time and trouble, it might not be worth it. Apart from the basement for your swimming pool, we understand that. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, basements aside, if you can do anything to add floor space, then that is going to enhance value. It could become another bedroom. It could become more, uh, you know, living space in a house. Uh, you know, you could make you a nice open plan. People like open plan living at the moment, right? There's a real trend for that. So knocking a wall down or a single story extension to square off a kitchen, that sort of thing um, can add value. You guys can, you know, maybe a master bedroom in the loft. Uh, anything that's going to add square footage to a property is is typically going to do well as long as, like Carol said, you know you need to control your costs because these things can escalate, and you've got to make sure that it's going to add as much value as you're spending on, on it. Plus, you know you want a profit built in there as well. Um, this might sound kind of counterintuitive, but in terms of the mistakes that we have made, um, sorry, um, I, I I think. The, the thing that we learned, or certainly from our market point of view, what we tried to do early on was cut cost as much as possible. And, you know, it's the typical like magnolia box effect that you see on Homes Under the Hammer. You know, it's like, oh, well, we thought we could do some of this work ourselves to save a few pounds. We thought we'd just paint it on magnolia rather than thinking about design. And actually, um, where we have put more time and effort into creating something that, that stands out a little bit, that the return on that will be far more than what the extra paint cost at B&Q or, you know, an extra couple of pounds on a square meter of tiles. Um, it's, it's when we try to make money by saving money that it tends to backfire, if that makes sense. So actually investing in, it's why I like investing in our own home because we create something that we like, we're proud of and buyers come in and they appreciate that rather than the cheapest kitchen and that, you know, painting everything magnolia or white. Um, actually investing a little bit to make something feel homely and, and stand out can pay back more than more than it costs you. Fantastic. And I think that's great. I mean, I'm going to be looking to kind of wrap things up now. So I'm just wondering if there's anything else that we should be covering um, in terms of questions. Actually, actually, here's something that we haven't we haven't uh, um, talked about. And this comes from 
Bunto. Um, what are your views on new builds, um, especially in terms of reselling after a few years? I hear they're overpriced and mostly marked towards first time buyers. And that is actually a very, very good point because you know there is a different market out there, the people that like buildings with character, but then other people that think, well, actually, they, they sound like, you, know, you have a building with character, but actually it may need more renovation. Or you have a new build which might you know, be more in nick and everything will last longer. But actually, have you priced out any renovation? Mm. There? What, what do you think about new builds, Carol? Uh, well, I think the new, the premium on new builds is usually quoted at between five and fifteen percent. Okay. Um, so you've already got you've got to factor that in. But I would say um, it's always worth asking for a discount on new builds. Developers usually will will give some discount in some way, or you know, put in the fixtures and furnishings, or do an upgrade of the kitchen. So I would try it because the, the discounts you can get can be five to fifteen percent. So you could cancel out uh, a premium. There, there are problems with new builds. Um, you, know, you have to be careful. There have been reports of um, shoddy builds, and you do need to be careful that all the snagging is done, and they get all the warranties and the backup. Um, but yes, I, I mean that would save having to do a lot of the renovation, and might attract some people more than the older homes. Okay. Um, all right. I mean, Mike, actually, before we move on to that, do you have anything to comment on that? Because you're obviously a big fan of renovation. Yeah. I mean, from a, so if, if, if you're looking for something sort of ready made to move into without any hassles, then they absolutely serve a purpose. Um, I'm just sort of glancing, you know, in, in terms of, from an investment point of view, I would tend to avoid them. I think there are better options out there. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that if we want to invest, it's not just a case of parking our money somewhere. It's quite an active thing to do. We've got to work. You know, if we want to return, I think we should we should work for it. Um, and yeah, I, I think there are, from an investment point of view, I think there are better options than the new builds. So I, I tend to shy away from them. Okay. All right. Good. Love the honesty. So what I'm going to now do is um, I've had a little look, and we've obviously answered the most um, top questions. So I'm going to just start to wrap things up. So if there are any other questions, please get them in. But I was going to summarize what we've talked about because we've talked about a lot. So here are the top bits. And if everybody wants to pay attention to this bit, it's that first of all, there are three stages of financial freedom. And the best way to set your goals is to realize that there are going to be these three stages. So financial security, so covering your essential costs, uh, independence to cover your lifestyle needs and then freedom to get your desired lifestyle. Um, the great tip about renting a room is that you get seven and a half thousand pounds tax free if you do that and also some company potentially during another lockdown. Um, research nearby areas to see if you can add value as well in terms of renovating. Think long term. So we heard about how important it is to think long term to be able to see any um, appreciation in property prices as well. Um, also look, uh, look at a property potentially as an investment property if you if you want to maintain a more transient life, you can still invest, still have a property, but not necessarily keep it um, uh, bed you down somewhere. Um, there's also potential to spread uh, uh, buying a property with a spouse or potentially limited company, but always uh, uh, look at a tax advisor if you want to deal with tax efficiently. Um, furnish by so let's more tax efficient. Have a work to ha work from home station. Dress up your outside space. And, ha and potentially emphasize getting fast broadband. I know black spots, that's from Carol, it's fantastic. Um, also, if you plan to move within three to five years, maybe it might not be so good to renovate. Um, single story extensions and lock conversions are much better than basements. Uh, but make sure that you get all the right uh, planning applications or uh, permitment uh, development rights or check with a regulator once you've done it. So those are three good tips there. Um, and we talked about having three or more into a shared living space that you might be able to get a higher profit from that. Great quote here, buy to wait, don't wait to buy. Well done, Mike, love that one. Um, uh, always look at, uh, the, the best thing to look at is adding floor space, beware the magnolia effect, cool, I've got loads of cliches there, I love this, loads of terms. Uh, beware the magnolia effect, that it's better to spend time on, on design and good design than just going for the cheapest option. And then, end up with Carol's, beware of the five to 15% premium on new builds. Why don't you ask for the same amount of a discount? So there you go, so that's kind of wrapping up everything. Um, if we didn't get to your question um, or you have any more questions, please drop us an email at questions at timesmoneymentor.co.uk and we'll get back to you. We also cover um, all aspects of personal finance and life stages on our website, so check it out. We've got loads of stories there. We have loads of tips on actually what you can do. We actually give a list of all the things you can do to kind of add the value to your property. We also have um, articles where we list all the costs of selling your property. So if you have any other you know, questions about specific details, do check our website out. It's free to access, it's outside the paywall. It has guides, real people stories, and independent product reviews. 
and also the option to ask a mentor with any further questions you want. Finally, keep an eye out for any um, of our next webinars and do share the details because we want to help as many people as possible. So follow us at Times Money Mentor on social media and sign up to our newsletter. And this is being recorded, so um, do watch it back. Of course, there's great information from the Property Insider website and also Times Property. Um, so, and there are newsletters there as well and social media channels to, channels to follow there too. So all it really leaves us to do, because um, we've got four minutes left, is to thank everybody. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, first of all, to Carol um, uh, from Property at The Times and Sunday Times, Mike from Inside Property Investing, um, both of you for sparing the time, both your expertise um, at understanding where the market's going and the market dynamics, as well as also living it as well and, and, and building up a property portfolio of, yourself, um, of your own has been incredibly valuable. Um, and answering people's questions has been great. And also yeah, sharing your own personal stories has been, has been really interesting as well. And thank you to everyone that's watching for um, asking your questions as well and for your time. We really, really appreciate it. And if you have any other follow-up, do let us know. So thank you so much. I um, hope you have a, a lovely day and stay safe inside your home, away from the rain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.